Senate will come back to order. Secretary will read House Bill 312. House Bill 312 by Representative Carson of the 46th and others. A bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 13 of Title 33 of the OCGA relating to insurance holding company systems so as to provide for comprehensive revision of the provisions regulating insurance holding company systems and for other purposes. The Committee of the Senate on Insurance and Labor recommends that this bill do pass. Through with the order, Mr. President.
thank you. Uh, Chair and I, Senator on the 29th, present the bill. Thank you, Mr. President. It's my privilege to present House Bill 312. This bill is an update to Georgia's already existing holding company law. And the update will make Georgia's law consistent with the model law adopted by the National Association of Insurance Commissioners as part of the association's solvency modernization initiative that was undertaken following the economic crisis in 2008. Ten other states have already adopted these or substantially similar revisions to their code. You know, insurance companies are often affiliated with, through common ownership or control, other insurance and non-insurance companies. The existing law generally grants the commissioner authority to regulate an acquisition or merger of an insurance company and to regulate financial transactions involving an insurance company and its affiliates. The revisions in this bill simply provide the commissioner with additional information to identify and monitor risks presented by affiliated companies that may have a financial impact on the regulated insurance company and to provide the commissioner with authority to coordinate regulatory activities with other U.S. and international insurance and financial services regulators. There are no questions. Uh, Mr. President, I'll be glad to yield the well. There are no questions, Senator. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the bill? Is the objection granted? Port of committee which failed pass the bill. The chair is none. Port of committee is agreed to. Shall the main question be now put? Are there any objections? The chair is none. The main question is ordered. Shall this bill now pass? The question is on the pass of the bill. All those in favor of the bill will vote aye. Those opposed, no. Secretary will unlock the machine. On the pass of the bill, the yeas are 46 and the nays are zero. And this bill, having received records of the Constitution majority, is therefore passed. Secretary will read House Bill 315. House Bill 315 by Representative Cooper of the 43rd and others. A bill to be entitled an act to amend Article 1 of Chapter 26 of Title 43 of the OCGA relating to registered professional nurses so as to provide for continuing competency requirements and further purposes. The Committee of the Senate on Health and Human Services recommends that this bill do pass by substitute. The Health and Human Services Committee offers the following substitute to House Bill 315. A bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 26 of Title 43 of the OCGA relating to nurses so as to implement measures to ensure the integrity and quality of nursing professionals and for other purposes. Amendment 1. Senator Miller of the 40th and others offer the following amendment. Amend the Senate Health and Human Services Committee substitute to House Bill 315 by inserting after liability on line 6 the following. To amend code section 43-34-25 of the OCGA relating to delegation of certain medical acts to advanced practice registered nurses and for other purposes. Amendment 2. Senator Ligon of the 3rd and others offer the following amendment. Amend the Senate Health and Human Services Committee substitute to House Bill 315 by inserting after liability on line 6 the following. To amend 
Chapter 24A of Title 43 of the OCGA relating to massage therapy practice, so as to revise provisions and for other purposes. Through with the order, Mr. President. Chair recognize Senator of the 45th to present the bill. Thank you, Mr. President. Members of the Senate, I rise in support of House Bill 315, and I believe there's two amendments to it. This bill requires registered professional nurses and licensed professional practical nurses to meet continuing competency requirements in layman's terms, that is, continuing education. It begins with their renewal in 2016. That's the renewal cycle. It also requires nurses and healthcare entities to report suspected professional violations to the Board of Nursing and to the Board of Examiners of licensed practical nurses. With that, Mr. President, I'll be glad to yield to any questions. There's two amendments on the floor. I do support both of the amendments. I'll yield for any questions. There's, uh, there are no questions, Senator. Thank you very much. Um, committees have been read, or amendment, floor amendments have been read. Chair and I, Senator, from the 40th to present amendment number one. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, amendment number one by myself, the Senator from the first, and the Chairman of the Health Committee from the 45th. This body passed this bill about allowing advanced practical registered nurses to order MRIs, CAT scans, et cetera. Uh, about a week ago, I went over to the Health Committee in the House, and uh, about 20 minutes before the meeting, I was given a substitute. and. During the committee, which lasted about an hour, the committee debated the substitute, which was offered by the vice chair over there, uh, and it was quite apparent that the committee didn't think too highly of the substitute. After about an hour, I suggested to the chairperson, well, perhaps we want to table my bill and put it in the subcommittee, work out the language so we can get this thing passed. The bill was tabled, and unfortunately, that seems to be quite a trend over in the House Health and Human Service Committee, table it and then do nothing. So when I reviewed today's legislation and looked at this particular bill, it has appeared to me that by adding this amendment, it would truly perfect it. So myself, the senator from the first, and the chairman of our committee ask that you support this amendment. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Chair, recognize Senator Room 26 for a question. Will the gentleman, uh, the Senator, yield? I yield. Senator, can nurses order MRIs now? I'm sorry? I said, can nurses order MRIs now? Advanced practical registered nurses can order them in life threatening situations. Physicians' assistants can order them under any circumstance. And throughout the country, advanced practical nurses can order them under any circumstances except in Georgia. Uh, isn't it true uh, on line 11 and 12 you, you strike out the life threatening? Yes, on so that they go to order an under situ situation versus life threatening. That's correct, sir. And subject to a physician's protocol, they have to have an agreement with a physician. Some of the year further. Does the doctor have to provide the prescription or whatever for the MRI? Usually the, they the, write a slip out for you to, for me to go to the, get an MRI. The, doc, the doctor has to authorize the advanced practical registered nurse with a protocol under what circumstances that they can order an MRI. That is correct. There are no questions, Thank Senator. You. Chair recognizes the senator from the uh, fir third <laughs> to, uh, to uh, present amendment number two.
Thank you, Mr. President. In our tourism industry along the coast, they frequently hire seasonal massage therapists coming in from other states. And uh, this requires that their residency documents be verified through the, the uh, verification system that, that, we, that we established when we did our um, immigration reform. And then they would operate under the license of that, of that resort. If there are no questions, I'll yield the well, Mr. President. Chair, recognize Senator from the 42nd for a question. Will Senator yield? Yes. Um, is, is this a, a loophole in the broader employment requirements? In other words, we passed an immigration bill, or y'all passed an immigration bill that, um, that required employers to go through a variety of, of, of checks. Did this not get captured? Well, and if not, it, why not? I don't know. It, it, it may not have, but in the terms of the seasonal worker coming in, it just they wanted to make reference that those documents that were provided to verify the residency in another state were those secure and verifiable documents. Will the Senate further yield? Yes. And then what 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 how does it change the law in in subsection B, it, it just allows them to, to, to operate under right. that other if, license? If, if, they, if they meet the requirements of one through four, and then they would operate under the license of, of, of that resort. Well, and will we yield for one final one, question? One more. Yes. As I, as I see it, you're, they can't be a resident of this state, but they have to have a secure and verifiable document under 50-36-2, right. is that it, right? If you're a resident of this state, you can't get a provisional license. I okay. mean, you, you'll, you'll operate under our regular licensing procedures. But if you're in another state and you are licensed and you want to come, come back to the state of Georgia, then you have to meet these requirements one through four in order to get your six-month provisional license. So, and it just adds that the documents that you'll provide will meet those requirements. They'll be secure and verifiable documents. Chair, recognize Senator from the 39th for a question. Will Senator Yield? Uh, yes, sir. What, what is the problem you're trying to correct? Is there a problem that's been, that you're aware of or has been reported well, to you? Well, we're, we're clearing, up, clearing up how these provisional licenses will be obtained in, in, in our tourism industry. Apparently, there's been an issue with it, and we want to maintain the integrity of that, and, and that's the reason for this. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll yield the well. Okay, amendment number one, which is authored by the senator from the 40th, is there objection? There is objection to amendment number one. If you're in favor of amendment number one, authored by the senator from the 40th, rise, stand, and be counted. Reverse. No, I just counted. Mm. On the pa on the amendment, the yeas are nineteen, the nays are twenty, and amendment number one is lost. Question now is on amendment number two. All the, um, is there objection to amendment number two? Is, is there objection? Without objection, amendment number two is adopted. Question now is on the adoption of committee, su committee substitute as amended. Is there objection? Without objection, the uh, committee substitute as amended is adopted. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the bill? Is there objection to agreeing the Porter Committee which favor pass the bill? Chairs none, the Porter Committee is agreed to. Shall the main question be now put? Are there any objections? The chair is none and the main question is ordered. Shall this bill now pass? The question is on the pass of the bill. All those in favor of the bill will vote aye, those opposed no, and the secretary will unlock the machine.
Yeah. That'd be good, Nancy. On the pass of the bill, the yeas are 41, the nays are 50. And this bill, having received Rex Constitution majority, is therefore passed. <laughs> Chair recognized, Senator from the 47th. President. Mr. President, I move the Senate adhere to its disagreement to the House substitute to Senate Bill 101 and the conference committee be appointed. Read the caption. Senate Bill 101 by Senators again of the 47th and others. A bill to be entitled an act to amend titles 8, 16, 27, and 43 of the OCGA relating to buildings and housing, crimes and off offenses, games and fish, and professions and businesses respectively, so as to regulate the sale, use and firearms, use and possession of firearms in this state and for other purposes. Is there objection? Without objection, the chairs will appoint the Senator from the 47th, Senator from the 18th. And the senator from the 14th is conferees to SB 101. Secretary will read House Bill 389. House Bill 389 by Representative Taylor of the 173rd and others. A bill to be entitled an act to amend Title 33 of the OCGA relating to insurance so as to sunset requirements to provide conversion and enhance conversion rights and coverage and for other purposes. The Committee of the Senate on Insurance and Labor recommends that this bill do pass. Through with the order, Mr. President. Chair and I, Senator Miller, 29. Thank you, Mr. President. It's my privilege to bring before you today House Bill 389. Uh, House Bill 389 deals with conversion and assignment system policies. These policies were originally designed to provide a safety net for individuals who leave employer group coverage and are not eligible for an individual policy due to a pre-existing condition. Uh, effective January 1st of next year, changes in federal law will make conversion policies as well as the Georgia Health Insurance Assignment System obsolete. New federal law will require guaranteed access to individual coverage with portability and renewability and will eliminate the need for this safety net approach. Georgia consumers will be able to purchase health insurance regardless of pre-existing health conditions on January the 1st of next year, allowing the current population on conversion policies and in the health insurance assignment system new options for coverage in the individual market or via the health insurance exchange. And that's simply what House Bill 389 does is prepare the way uh, for that change mandated by federal law. There are no questions, Mr. President. I'll yield the well. There are a few questions. Chair recognize Senator from 33rd. Senator Yale. Yes, sir. Senator, when does this law become effective? Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> this law will become effective uh, upon the uh, availability of coverage through the Federal Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. So there'll be no lapse in time where there wouldn't be anything available for these folks. Is no, that correct? Sir. That is correct. Thank you very much. Chair recognize Senator from the 42nd for a question. Well, Senator you? Yes. Is it not true that if you would like to see the Affordable Care Act put into place in an efficient way, you can support this legislation? I'm sure the Senator uh, is more familiar with that subject than I am. No further questions, sir. Thank you.
Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the bill? Is there objection? Agree in the Porter Committee, which fail will pass the bill. Chairs, none. Porter Committee is agreed to. Shall the main question be now put? Are there any objections? Chairs, none. Main questions ordered. Shall this bill now pass? Question on the pass of the bill. All those in favor of the bill should vote aye. Those opposed, no. Secretary, unlock the machine. Yeah, let's do that. I'd like to uh, welcome the three pages that we have with us that are still remaining. Uh, please join me, Senate, in welcoming these wonderful pages. Tyler, Melvin, uh, Juan, uh, Chris Nos, and then uh, Brianna House. Good to have you all with us. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Hard workers. That work ethic will serve you well in life. On the pass of the bill, the yeas are 43 and the nays are 2. And this bill, I receive Rex Constitution majority, are therefore, is therefore adopted. <laughs> Secretary will read House Bill 458. House Bill 458 by Representative Atwood of the 179th and others. A bill to be entitled an act to amend code section 44-3-94 of the OCGA relating to damage or destruction of units, restoration, vote not to restore, and allocation of insurance deductible and for other purposes. The Committee of the Senate on Insurance and Labor recommends that this bill do pass. Through with the order, Mr. President. Chair recognizes Senator from the third to present the bill. Thank you, Mr. President. HB uh, 458 increases the deductible cap for condominium insurance association insurance policies from $2,500 to $5,000, and uh, that allows. Uh, uh, those condominiums to have lower uh, premiums uh, on their policies and can save them some money. This has not been changed uh, in some time, so it will be a good cost-saving measure for, for, for condominium owners. So unless there are any questions, Mr. President, I'll yield the well. No questions, Senator. <coughs> Does any other Senator wish to speak for or against the bill? Is the objection agreeing to the committee which fail to pass the bill? Chair is none. Porter Committee is agreed to. Shall the main question be now put? Are there any objections? The chair is none, and the main question is ordered. Shall this bill now pass? Question on the pass of the bill. All those in favor of the bill will vote aye. Those opposed, no. And the secretary will unlock the machine.
On the passage of the bill, the yeas are 44 and the nays are zero, and this bill, MC Rex Constitution Majority, is therefore adopted.
that to you. That's good. Thank you. Chair recognizes Senator on the 53rd. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate disagree to the House Amendment to the Senate, the Senate substitute to House Bill 142. Read the caption. House Bill 142 by Representative Ralston of Seventh and others. A bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 5 of Title 21 of the OCGA relating to ethics and government so as to change certain provisions relating to powers and duties of the Georgia Government Transparency and Campaign Finance Commission and for other purposes. Is there objection? Without objection, the Senate has disagreed. Secretary will read House Bill 361. House Bill 361 by Representative Lindsay of the 54th and others. A bill to be entitled an act to amend Article 2 of Chapter 6 of Title 34 of the OCGA relating to membership and labor organizations so as to provide for definitions and for other purposes. The Committee of the Senate on Insurance and Labor recommends that this bill do pass by substitute. The Insurance and Labor Committee offers the following substitute to House Bill 361. A bill to be entitled an act to amend Article 2 of Chapter 6 of Title 34 of the OCGA relating to membership in labor organizations so as to provide for definitions and further purposes. Amendment 1. Senator McCoon of the 29th and others offer the following amendment. Amend House Bill 361 by deleting the quotation mark at the end of line 101 and inserting after line 101 the following. D. Nothing in this code section shall pro prohibit an employer from entering into a contractual agreement with an organization to provide annually for a specific period in which employees may change their automatic payroll deduction status and for other purposes. Amendment 2. Senator Henson of the 41st offers the following amendment. Amend the Senate Insurance and Labor Committee substitute to House Bill 361 by deleting lines 6 through 9 and inserting in lieu thereof the following. Contracts permitting labor organizations to deduct fees from employees' earnings too. By deleting section 6 and redesignating section 7 and 8 as section 6 and 7 respectively. Through with the order, Mr. President. Chair recognizes Senator from the 21st present the bill. Thank you, Mr. President and fellow senators. I bring before you House Bill 361. House Bill 361 would protect individuals and Georgia workers' paychecks and income in the event they choose not to participate in a labor union. It is commonly referred to as the paycheck, prote paycheck protection. Ultimately, it is the best interest of the employee that he or she be empowered to make the determination as to whether or not to join a union and whether or not to financially support a union. Before I review the bill by section, I would like to clarify what this bill does not do. These are three important points. This bill does not prevent unions from organizing in Georgia. This bill does not prevent individuals from joining a union in Georgia. And this bill does not trump or negate any existing collectively bargained contracts. Those are three things this bill does not do. I'd like to review the bill now by summary, summarizing each section. When you look at section one, the highlights are employer de definition clarification to exempt MARTA. MARTA expressed concerns that inclusion in this bill would jeopardize, jeopardize federal funding. It also defines federal labor laws. 
and it also defines governmental body to provide including that state and local governments and their subdivisions. Section two, what it really does is it enumerates specific rights granted employers under federal labor laws. Section three, expressly, expressly protects employers' rights under federal law when contracting with state and local governments or during collective bargaining or union organization efforts. This really only amends, amends the Georgia Code section that pertains to membership in a labor organization. The real key sections are sections four and five. They provide for employee protection by requiring written authorization from an employee and would also protect an employee's income at the time of the withdrawal by allowing for immediate stoppage of compulsory union dues. Under current law, an employee who decides to opt out of a union could potentially have money taken out of his or her paycheck for the remainder of the year. At a time when our economy remains sluggish and family budgets are tight, employees should have the financial protections afforded under this section. Section six incorporates the language from Senate Bill 227, which makes important reforms to the state's unemployment system. Without this, Important language, Georgia's small employers will continue to subsidize a handful of companies taking advantage of a loophole in the law. These companies are at the federal maximum allowed rate, yet the system as a whole is forced to subsidize additional benefit payments upwards to $10 million per year for their seasonal employees. This is not fair, and it is costing Georgia, Georgia's job creators millions of dollars and will damage an already weak unemployment trust fund. This will treat both public and private employers the same. This bill just further and strengthens, th strengthens our status as a right to work state. A key component is giving the employee the choice to join or fi financially support a union. Mr. President, I will entertain questions or yield the will. Chair, recognize Senator Rumble 56 for a question. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. Will the Senator yield? Yes. Senator, isn't it true that this bill will uh, provide protection and choices for uh, Georgians? Yes. Senator, we yield for one further question? Yes. Isn't it true that this is a real win-win for both employees and employers in the state of Georgia? It's a win-win for both and economic development. Thanks, Senator. Thank you. Chair, recognize Senator on the 42nd for a question. Will Senator yield? Yes. I have, I have two... Uh, Two sets of questions. Will you yield for, for that? Yes. This is your first first time in the well in the Senate. Is that not true? Yes. Um, my first question is, uh, what good does it do under state law to say what federal law says? In other words, you have a whole section here, section two, that identifies rights protected under federal labor laws. I mean, we don't write those. We don't interpret those. We don't have any reason to list them, do we, as a state government? Uh, no, we do not. So why would we not just delete that section? We, uh, we wanted to put that in there to let uh, employers know that, uh, and employees know that we were uh, following federal law. But you're not intending to change federal law, right? No. My, my, second, uh, my second question is, why, why do we exempt certain people? If this is so great for employees, why is it that we give certain employees this right and other employees get exempted? Well, with um, concerning MARTA, for example, we were worried, uh, you know, you had the... Um, National um, Railway Act, and uh, we were concerned about losing federal funds if uh, we did this to MARTA, so we did not want to jeopardize uh, federal funds. Do you feel like whether we get federal funds should define people's rights at their employment place? Well, I, I think when you're talking about uh, a complete transit system and the, the volume of dollars that uh, flow through MARTA, I think we have to protect that, uh, that one one entity. Will you yield further? Yes. What about educators, law enforcement officers, or firefighters? The I same. mean, do we not want to protect them, to use your word, as we would everybody else? Same, hold true, same holds true for them. And, and, 
You mean that it, they depend on federal funding and therefore they no, have they, fewer rights? No, they don't. No, they don't. But uh, that's just uh, something that was uh, written in this bill. I, I guess my question is, is what, why? What, uh, let's see, let me look at the section on that. Nine, it's uh, lines 98 through 101. Excuse me, 96 through 101. And that, that, that's my final yeah. question, Senator, so I, okay. I, I appreciate your indulgence. All right, thank you. No, I'm an af Okay. I, mean, I would I, like an answer to it. I just, <laughs> I just won't follow up on yeah. it is all I'm saying. Okay. Well, I, I, uh, I think we wanted that in the bill to protect the, the, the law enforcement, so. Chair, recognize Senator Room 26 for a question. Will the Senator yield? Uh, yes. Under this particular bill, if you look at, uh, I guess, page three, I would assume, assume by page three, page three, 87 through uh, 91, that would deal with school bus drivers and lunchroom workers, wouldn't it? I'm, I'm sorry, 87 with school? 87, lines 87 through 91, that would deal with bus drivers and school lunchroom workers, wouldn't it? Uh, I don't see that there. I don't see anything in lines 87 that says anything about that. Oh, I'm, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, I apologize. There's a substitute to it. Uh, excuse me for a minute. Let me just find the section in. So he should be working off the it's grain. A, a, I would assume in, in section four. It's the, L, uh, we're working off the green sheet. Yeah, I, I got you now. Uh, 89 through 93, page three. That would deal with lunchroom workers and school bus drivers, wouldn't it? I still don't see that on 85. On page three of the substitute, lines 89 through lines 93, no in the truth, it says, no employee shall deduct from the wages or other earnings of any employee any fee. Now, doesn't that, in the truth that that says that lunchroom workers and school bus drivers who are seasonal, who work during the school year, who have drawn unemployment during the summer months can no longer draw it. That, that deals in section six, I believe, um, Senator, not section four. Section six deals with uh, the Senate Bill 227. Um, section six. On page four and five. All right. What the base of that says is that lunchroom workers and school bus drivers are out. Well, um, what we're trying to do on that part of the bill, Senator, is this. The, there's public and private companies, and these private companies, these vendors come in, and they lowball to get these contracts with these school systems for different workers, for whether it's cafeteria workers or custodial or, or whatnot. And then what happens is they pay them a low wage, and then they expect them to go get unemployment during the off-seat off during the summer. And, um, and then we end up paying for that as a state. And so we're trying to not let them scam the system, basically. Send a year further. Yes. Isn't it true that money is taken out for unemployment? Yes. From the employer? Yes. Isn't it also true, Senator, that local boards of education have local workers who work for the school system itself, and they, during summer months, are not employed and have always been able to draw unemployment. If you speak, so speak. I'm not sure. Senator, yield further. Yes. 
Are you telling me you're in the well to explain a bill that you're not sure about? Well, I'm, I'm, sure, about, I'm sure about what the vendors are doing to come in and, and undercut and then uh, trying to get their, their seasonal employees to go and collect unemployment. I do know that's happening. So, Senator, isn't it true what you're saying is you really don't care about the local school lunchroom workers or the bus drivers? That's not true. Chair Egg and I, Senator from the 39th for a question. Will Senator yield? Yes. Uh, a couple of questions regarding uh, the situation. Isn't it true that these employees of these private companies are paying into the unemployment insurance system? Uh, I believe so, yes. And it's Senator Further Yield? Yes. And isn't it true that many of these workers during the summer and other seasons do look for uh, employment? Isn't that true? Uh, I believe so, yes. And if the Senator were further yield? Yes. Isn't it true that after having paid in to the system, having after school is out during the summer looking for employment, some of those, many of those uh, workers, lunchroom, bus drivers, cannot find employment and look to the unemployment system that they've paid into in order to sustain themselves during those, that period of unemployment. Isn't that true? Well, I mean, I, I don't know for each individual case, Senator, but I mean, with 8.5% unemployment, I think jobs are, are, are out there. So I think there's the job market is uh, there's some jobs available. Well, the Senator, further you. Yes. I, I would think that with that, that high unemployment, that the reverse would be true, that there are fewer jobs and thus would even make it more important that they be able to collect unemployment insurance. That's my yes. point of view. I, you don't okay. necessarily need to respond. I appreciate your answers Thank you. to my questions. Thank you, Senator. Okay. Chair, recognize Senator from the eighth, eighth for a question. Thank you, Mr. President. The Senator to yield. Yes. Isn't it true that firemen, policemen, and teachers are exempt in this bill because there's no collective bargaining in Georgia? Isn't that true? Uh, I'm sorry. The firemen, policemen, and are exempt from this bill. Is that not true? Yes. Thank you. No further questions, Senator. I'll yield the will. Chair, recognize Senator the 41st for a question. I mean, for the uh, speak. Thank you, members of the Senate and Mr. President, for the opportunity to speak. Um, I come to you today with several concerns on this bill. Number one, uh, much of this bill, as stated in questions earlier, are covered under federal law. Section two of the bill, as stated earlier, is uh, probably not even needed, and its purpose in this bill is questionable. The effect, you know, I, I can't understand what it would be. You know, the secret about uh, ballot elections and authorization cards are determined under federal law, labor law, and I cannot see this having any real effect. Section three, which again says a government body can't, you know, cause somebody to waive statutory rights under federal labor laws, uh, again to me seems to make little sense. Again, it's you know just trying to poke a nose at local control. No government body, meaning local government body, can cannot uh, take action. The um, you know, written authorizations and other things in Section 4 and 5 are more of an employer problem causing them difficulties, and I'll skip over them. My real problems uh, 
that I wish to discuss with you is Section 6. Section 6 is a grave concern to me. Section 6 brings a total amount of unfairness to Georgia's unemployment compensation benefits. And contrary to what has been brought to you here today, that public employees at schools that are school employees cannot draw unemployment benefits if they do not work during the summer, they're school or bus drivers. That is true. But those school employees have benefits and usually a decent wage. 20 years in ago in Georgia, um, I think longer than that, I think Senator Forth's father even worked for those school bus drivers. Most school bus drivers and other employees in Georgia worked for the school system. As time has gone on, we have seen people trying to save money as the state has cut billions from education and other factors have impacted our public schools, and they have desperately tried to save money. And one way they've done that is hiring private outside companies to come in to run some of these services within schools, which we have allowed by state law. These private companies often pay little more than minimum wage and often have no benefits. These employees are not on the same footing of those contractually with school. These seasonal part-time employees are, as I say, low paid and often do not, you know, wait until the next season starts. In Section 6 it says, you know, reasonable uh, belief that you will, reasonable assurance of returning to work on line 168, 169 even with a ass reasonable assurance, those people go out and look for work, as do other seasonal employees. What's wrong about this bill? This bill is not saying to Georgians that if you are a seasonal employee with a reasonable stand, uh, belief that you'll go back to work, you don't get unemployment benefits. This is saying for this one industry, for this one group of people, they cannot get unemployment benefits. If you're a seasonal worker in agriculture or retail or for Six Flags with a reasonable expectation of returning to that company, you can draw unemployment compensation. This is wrong. And it's wrong for a host of reasons. It's wrong because it's being pushed by private school companies trying to make a quick buck. It's wrong because these are workers who work for our children. Let's make no, no doubt out here that school systems depend on bus drivers and cafeteria workers for the safety and benefit of our children. And when these men and women know that they can work another job, any job, and if they've worked enough to pull their bank up, if they go to the unemployment office and they do the things they have to do to get unemployment, like look for work and meet the other conditions required to draw this unemployment, that they will get unemployment. But yet, here, this one industry, for, because of powerful special interest groups don't want them to have it, uh, are not going to be able to get unemployment benefits. And some of those good people that protect the safety of our children in the cafeterias or the bus drivers, that they won't be able to keep those jobs. You'll have greater turnover. You'll have greater risk. You'll have bus drivers that maybe aren't as good as they were because we can't keep the same group. And yes, some of them that are there now don't find jobs right away, but many of them do. But this is just an unfair special treatment in Senate Bill 227 to bring out these people for this reason. And that's now in 361. Now, many of you know that 361 is a, uh, bill, House Bill 361 is a scorecard bill on the Chamber of Commerce. Well, I will put this to you. You're endangering the whole underlying bill if you do not vote for Amendment 2, the Henson Amendment, which will remove and strike Section 6, which is this unemployment compensation. Senate Bill 227 was put in separately. It did not make it from the Rules Committee. And while the author of the bill is on rules and was ill that day, 19 other members didn't pull it off rules either. Second of all, it did not go through the House Committee or the House. 
227, which is in section six of this bill, has not been vetted, it has not been debated, and this is a bad way to do business, and I think both sides of the aisle here can acknowledge that and remove that bill. Especially when we look at Article 3, Section 5, Paragraph 3 of the Georgia Constitution, which provides a bill shall not, shall pass, shall not pass which, refer, which refers to more than one subject matter. Whether an act violates the multiple subject matter rule depends on whether a bill's provisions seek to accomplish a single objective. Wall versus Board of Elections. The Constitution looks to unity of purpose. Mentioning several cases, thus an act may amend various titles of the code without violating the subject matter rule so long as the provision of an act all logically relate to one general purpose. But conversely, an act containing multiple amendments to the same title may yet violate the subject matter rule. Listen, you can look at contractual payroll deduction language, but you will not and I cannot see a logical or, 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 or natural connection to be the, these items. By, by passing Section 6, you endanger the whole bill. And you do a wrong to thousands, not 100, but thousands of Georgia workers. I'll let other people come. I know there's many here, and we have limited time for each of us to speak. But I urge you adopt Amendment 2. I urge you to treat Georgia workers fairly. If you're going to come back next year attacking all seasonal workers, and I pray you do not, then do so. But carving out one industry is not fair and equitable. It's not equitable just because some workers at a school who decide to take a job that has benefits or better pay go into an agreement where they won't get the benefits. But if you're with a private company, you, you right now earn those benefits and deserve them. If you're with a private company in a seasonal job at Six Flags, you can get those benefits. If you're a private job working in the agricultural injury, I, I, industry, you can get those benefits. This isn't right. Strike Section 6, adopt Amendment 2, and if you like the underlying bill, you're going to make it a, a lot more uh, successful for being legally challenged. I yield for questions. Chair, recognize Senator 39 for a question. Senator Yield. I yield. Are you saying that the putting the two subject matters, one on unemployment compensation and the other on dues check off, putting those two in one bill uh, creates a multiple subject matter issue and would put at risk the entire bill? Is that what you're saying? Uh, yes, Senator. I, I believe that that is clear. And, and I've served 10 terms now and rarely seen um, something that would be so clear in my opinion. No further questions, Senator. Thank you. Chair recognizes the Senator from the 39th speak to the bill. Mr. President, members of the Senate, uh, the Senator from the 41st, I think was uh, very did a very good job of outlining the concerns and the problems with this piece of legislation. But beyond that, all our legislation, our budget legislation and our other legislation often uh, is a reflection of what we value and what we don't value down here. And it is unfortunate uh, that apparently we don't value those bus drivers who transport our, transport our children. I don't know, ever since they put cameras on buses, uh, I've come to understand how difficult a job that is, transporting uh, children, <laughs> four, five, 10, 11, 12 year olds, how difficult that job is. Um, uh, children can be difficult to handle, particularly in large numbers. And uh, those bus drivers really, in effect, are the first line of defense, the first line of protection. They're the you know, after the children leave home, those bus drivers are the first people they see and the last people they see before they go on home. And it's unfortunate and that it apparently we don't, uh, through legislation like this, we're indicating that we are not as covetous of their, their roles as we ought to be. 
Uh, I think the idea, as the senator from the 41st said, that we may not have uh, the bus drivers uh, with the experience and the devotion to those children that we would like. Uh, we may not have those kinds uh, uh, of bus drivers as often as we would like with this kind of legislation. And it seems to me that if you're for privatization, I generally am not for privatization, but it seems to me that uh, <laughs> you know, if you're for privatization, uh, you're creating a good reason for people who are against it to fight against it. Um, you know, <laughs> making a, you know, essentially we're making the employees of a privatized uh, system, a privatized employers, we're making them second class citizens. Those bus drivers and cafeteria workers who are employed by the private companies are in effect, we are making them increasingly second class citizens. I don't know how many of you are aware of the circumstances that went into us getting here in terms of these, uh, the, um, the, uh, of the temporary workers and denying them unemployment. I guess this is all a scheme to put money into the coffers of a uh, unemployment insurance fund that is going, that is going broke. Uh, and you know, the reason it's going broke is because Democrats and Republicans didn't do our due diligence for the last 10 to 15 years, you know, giving back the uh, unemployment tax back to the employers. And now we're at this point, now we want to extract a pound of flesh from these vulnerable workers. Uh, but last summer, after the commissioner instituted this rule, the De Federal Department of Labor issued a ruling. And, I, and it's a long, single-space letter. I'm going to read just an excerpt from it. Uh, the Federal Department of Labor said, we have reviewed changes to Georgia's Rule 300-2-9.07 concerning denial of unemployment compensation between and within academic years or terms to bus drivers and certain other workers employed by private companies under contract with educational institutions and school districts in the state for conformity with federal unemployment compensation law. For at least 30 years, it has been clear that while some educational workers may find temporary work over the summer, those private sector educational employee who's employees who do not and whose employers have paid into the unemployment insurance system are eligible for unemployment benefits. As we understand, as we understand the Georgia Rule 300-2 Dash 9.07 was amended effective January 30th, 2012 to more broadly address payment of unemployment compensation to educational workers, reflecting G. Uh, Georgia DOL's recent reinterpretation of its state uh, unemployment compensation law. This rule and its implementing policy published February 1st, 2012 in Georgia's Department of Labor's Unemployment Insurance Memorandum expand the between within terms denial provisions beyond what the Georgia Code authorizes. Since the between and within terms denial provisions of federal unemployment compensation law do not apply to individuals working for private companies, the new policy and regulation create an issue with federal unemployment compensation law, which requires as a condition of receipt of grants for the administration of the state law that the state have methods of administration to ensure full payment of unemployment compensation, quote unquote, when due. And this is, it's a long letter, as I said, I have a copy here and, we'll, and anyone who wants one can have a copy. But the bottom line is that the Federal Department of Labor turned back this attempt by the commissioner to deny unemployment benefits to these workers, bus drivers as well as uh, cafeteria workers. It seems to me <laughs> that at this point, what we need to do, particularly with the constitutional issue that we've already talked about, we need to vote for amendment number two and make sure that we do the right thing because in effect, what's gonna happen is the entire law is gonna go out the window. Uh, 
Um, you know, there's been a groundswell of public outrage at this. We need to go ahead and make sure that we do the right thing by these cafeteria workers and bus drivers. Mr. President, unless there is a uh, questions, I'll yield the well. Question. Chair, recognize Senator from 35th for a question. Will the Senator yield? Yes, I do. Uh, is it not true that this legislation would really create a, a hardship for union employers uh, because of uh, the get out anytime clause that's in it? Yeah, I think it'll, I think both parts of the bill will create hardships. Um, and, and I think it's important to make that distinction. As far as the uh, dues checkoff, that's one thing, but also with the unemployment compensation piece, uh, you know, the, these, uh, most of these folk or many of these people who uh, are being denied benefits are, are not unionized. They don't have the protections of the union and thus, uh, you know, we'll find, you know, so, we need to make that distinction. These are people. These are people who are not represented and are very vulnerable. Is, uh, will the gentleman further you? Yes, ma'am. Isn't it true that uh, many of the things that the uh, senator from the 29th said in his disclosure in the beginning that it that this bill would not do is uh, is already in place, and that's because it won't do it because it's already something that it does not do. Yeah. For, okay. Well, I, I have spoken, For and I don't know how many people in this chamber have spoken to people who have been denied their unemployment benefits, mm -hmm. people who have lost their homes because they could not, without those unemployment benefits, they weren't able to pay the bills, people who had to deny their children a full uh, three meals a day. I mean, this is not just theory. This is the reality that the people affected by uh, this unemployment insurance issue are people who are uh, losing out on the most basic uh, needs in life, food, shelter, and clothing, including children. A lot of these employees, uh, cafeteria workers and school bus drivers are women. Many of them are single mothers who depend on uh, these low paying jobs to, for their families to get by and when they're denied unemployment insurance, unemployment insurance that they've paid into, uh, they're even in a more difficult situation. Um, will the gentleman further year for one last? Yes, ma'am, I will. I isn't it true that in this state we have hardworking people who uh, work hard and, and uh, only want to make a good salary and if they choose to get into a union, they choose it. Many times they, they are not even offered this but this bill seems to favor uh, the rights of employees, employers rather than employees. And this is supposed to be government of the people, for the people, and by the people. I agree with you. Thank you. Right. Chair, recognize Senator from the 41st for a question. Senator Yield. I do. Senator, is it not true that I may have not adequately stated that Section 6 of the bill is not about union membership or, ne you know, those companies are not often non-union, if not, I don't, maybe always, I don't know, they're low income. So number section six of the bill has nothing to do with union membership. It's merely private companies that people will not be able to draw unemployment to do seasonal work, while as in ever every other industry where private companies, people are doing seasonal work, they would be able to draw unemployment benefits. But nothing to do with the rest of the bill, which is, about unions. You're absolutely correct. I think you did make that distinction, but it bears repeating that those seasonal workers, bus drivers, cafeteria workers, some are represented, most of them are not, and uh, are subject to being denied unemployment benefits. That's, that's a very important distinction to repeat. No further questions, Senator. Thank you. Chair and I, Senator from the 40th, speak to the bill.
Thank you, Mr. President. I'm, I'm going to be relatively brief. Uh, just a couple of points as respects the senator from the 41st and 39th to maybe rebut a couple of things here. Uh, in Section 6, particularly what I'm going to address, first of all, uh, organizations in favor of this include the Georgia Child Care Association, the National Federation of Independent Businesses, the Georgia Chamber, as well as the Georgia Traditional Manufacturers Association. The Labor Department has already interpreted state policy by what this statute does. And the feds have said we have to have statutes that reflect our policies. That's the point of this. The, uh, Right now, private educational workers, they are not allowed, or public educational workers, excuse me, are not allowed to collect unemployment. And we've got private companies also in this business, and they're encouraging their people to collect unemployment benefits. It's not fair. You, you've got one set of workers being treated one way, another set of workers the other way. And as long as someone has a reasonable insurance that they're going to get their job back in the fall, they should not be entitled to unemployment benefits. The, uh, like I said, this has saved the state about $8 million so far. As respects the constitutional issue that the gentleman from 39th and 41st broke up, they've been around here long enough to read Section 7. It's, it's called a severability clause, and I think that takes care of that issue. With that, Mr. President, I will yield the well. Chair, Senator has yielded the well. I understand he, he's approaching you to answer it, uh, Senator. All senators have a right to yield the well, and those that wish to um, do so. Chair, and I, Senator 33rd. Hi. Thank you, Mr. President. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator, I just wanted to make sure that. All of you were ready to hear these wonderful remarks of mine. I'm, I've got a few thousand words, so. Uh, <laughs> let me just say this. The senator from the 41st knows probably no more about labor than anyone in here. Of course, he, I haven't seen him do a lot of it, but, uh, uh, but he is quite <laughs> in jest. He's a friend of mine. He, he's an expert in labor things and, and has been for many, many years. And I uh, did a good job up here, and so did the Senator from the 39th. Listen, I'm a chamber man. Uh, I've owned six businesses. I've been successful at most of them. I won't say every one of them was a, a winner. Uh, but, uh, you know, I've been vice chairman of the chamber, their top producer, uh, a lifetime member, uh, board member of the year, and a large chamber. And, and I'm a businessman. But I'm a history buff, too. And some of you folks need to understand, or may not understand, and some of you may. Don't, don't be upset with me if you don't, uh, or if you already know this. But history teaches us how labor and business and the fragile relationship they have had, will have, and always will have. You know, around the turn of the century, people couldn't work in this country without being abused. There were a hundred women that died in New York jumping off a building because it was on fire because it was nothing but a fire trap. One hundred young women. Forty-three miners were killed by the Pinkerton Detective Agency under the approval, or not approval, but un, uh, under the uh, 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 auspices of being hired by uh, uh, one of the great uh, philanthropists. Can y'all say that word for me? Philanthropists, thank you, uh, that, own, that brought you know, on the steel companies here in America. Uh, you know, we've had people killed, people beaten to death. And people don't realize just what's happened. There was no protection for anybody until the point where the greatest progressive, who I think who framed the word progressive, was a Republican named Teddy Roosevelt, came to their aid. And he didn't want child labor to exist anymore because children were working 10 and 12 hours a day. And people were dying on their jobs because it wasn't safe to work where they worked in mills. And no one had a voice. And that's exactly the reason that labor came into being and became a very strong faction in this country. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'll be the first one to tell you that labor's overplayed their hand before. 
They let the wrong folks handle their books in the 50s and the 60s. We know that, that history. They're aware of that too. But let me tell you something, Enron and Wall Street and AIG didn't do any better. So if you look at the situation, again, it's a balance. It's a balance of business and labor that makes our country work so that no one's abused, that your employer cannot abuse you. And that's the reason there are labor laws to protect people. In fact, the first income tax was put into play because Roosevelt wanted to control big business. They couldn't, there was about five or six uh, robber barons there that were running this country. And he had to get a handle on them. I just think that if you're out of something to do, then go look for a law like this. There is nothing whatsoever wrong with someone asking to have his union dues deducted out of his paycheck. And the only purpose for this bill, in my opinion, is to kill, is to kill labor. What you want to do is to make it uh, harder for people to join the union, to, to uh, uh, work with the union, uh, for it to be very easy for them to pull out in a second. And you know, business has to rely on their customers and return customers. The unions have to rely on their members. You can't say you can leave it in two weeks and have the boss talk to you. This is just a situation where they want to hurt labor. My goodness, hadn't you heard them enough? Now, I know that union members don't often live in Atlanta Country Club. Some of them do. You might be surprised. And you might be surprised as to how bright and educated some of these folks in our uh, uh, unions and trade unions are. I've never had to send something back that a union plumber did. Nobody ever complains about the quality of their work. You know, I guess what I'm trying to tell you is, is that this is a punitive piece of legislation. Now, let me tell you something. I can't stand these folks. That, uh, if, if you want an example of this is a scorecard issue, well, great. You keep score. I don't pay any attention to it. Because what I think of when I see scorecard issues, and I've tried to explain that to the Chamber of Commerce before, they've tried to work with me a little bit, but I don't think they've gotten there yet. I think of the NRA, uh, some groups of the uh, so-called right to life, the Christian Coalition, which, of course, I'm of the Christian faith, but I had a problem finding somebody else that was a Christian in that group. It's kind of like Gandhi said, I like your Christ, I don't particularly care for your Christians. Uh, the bottom line is these groups that have one issue, you vote against them and you're gone. You, they're never going to be for you again. Well, let me tell you something. I hadn't heard from Coca-Cola in 15 years, but I didn't withdraw an amendment because they wanted me to. I can sleep. But this business here is unduly punitive and unfair. Rather than say we'd like to discuss with our members and we're obligated to share your voting record with them, it's a scorecard issue. Well, pal, you put my score down, but I've been elected 17 times. And most everybody along the way has been mad at me at one time or another, so I think I'm doing a pretty good job. Because you just can't be yourself and not say some things that sometimes people are going to disagree with. Now, I agree with the senator from the 41st, that, that Section 6 is, is unfair. What kind of people do you want taking your child and grandchildren to school and being in charge of them on a road in the rain? What kind of dedication do you want to draw? What kind of person do you want handling the nutrition of your child or your grandchildren? People look at pay, at pay in dollars what their qualifications are, what benefits there are to a job that puts them on an equal basis with everybody else in the workforce. You're going to get what you pay for, folks, and we're beginning to realize that. I'm just telling you that y'all to leave their... Uh, uh, by the way, I think it's going to also injure some businesses that are going to have to radically change a system they've already set up going to cost them mega dollars. 
But you know, if you, if you don't like unions, I can't criticize you. If you don't like business, I can't criticize you. But get to know them. And they're the people that hold this country together. And they're the people that go to work every day. Don't penalize them and step on them. Because ladies and gentlemen, when you step on them, they'll be back. And they won't forget it, and they shouldn't. Thank you. I yield the well. Senator has yielded. Chair recognized Senator from the 22nd. Speak to the bill. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, members of the Senate. I rise to speak on this measure that's before us this evening. I appreciate the remarks from the Senator from the 33rd. And, you know, I wish I had a, a gavel that I could do the same thing, but since I don't, I won't. You know, it's not often that we find ourselves at this place of where we've got measures that are brought before us that have a variety of things in them. I'm standing in this well this afternoon as the product of what is good about unions in the great state of Georgia. Unfortunately, uh, we in this chamber and in the legislature, we oftentimes have opportunity where we kind of dismiss and diminish the things that really matter to us. But the reality of it is that the only reason that I'm here and able to do what I do is because my father was a member of the unions. As an employee with Georgia Power, uh, he's a member of the Local 84 and still to this day is a member, though he's since retired. And in this bill that's before us, we've got really two competing issues. We've got the issue of how we handle labor, but then we've also got the issue of how we, as the senator from the 33rd put it so well, we mistreat those individuals who sent us here. I, I say it that way because at the end of the day, when I think about the senator from the 7th, when he was growing up and the people he went to church with, the little lady who he sat on her knee and she squeezed his cheeks and told him that when he grew up, he'd be somebody important. She was that same lady who probably drove the school bus. If she wasn't the lady who drove the school bus, then to the senator from the 49th, Miss Martha, who you went over on Sunday evening and had dinner with, she's the same lady who was your crossing guard. But at the end of the day, when we look at section six of this bill, we're saying to hell with you. We're saying that you really don't matter anymore. We're saying at the end of the day that even though you work, you do it well, you take care of our children when they cross the streets to get to the schools, when they ride the bus, when we feed them at the schools, you don't matter anymore. I got a problem with that today. At the end of the day, I think Hardy Davis and Dolores Davis would have a great problem with me as their child if I came to these hallowed halls and all of a sudden forgot who I was and where I came from. At the end of the day, we cannot, just because we're elected Mr. or Mrs., Senator to this or Senator to that, become elitist and not remember the people at the end of the day who got us here. Now let me talk about the merits of the bill 
because I can't invoke uh, the spirit of our distinguished former Senator Robert Brown and say things the way he would say them, but I can say them the way Hardy Davis would say them. And at the end of the day, when we talk about corporations in Georgia and the real spirit of this legislation in 361, if I talk about that for a moment, this is not a competitiveness issue in the state of Georgia. Georgia's corporations are some of the most competitive in the country. In fact, I've got the data to support it. Here on the screen this afternoon, I want to show you just a few examples of what I mean by that. Now, you may not be able to fully read it. I hope we can get it uh, in a more visible form. But on this screen here this afternoon are Georgia's employee earnings of public companies and the profits that they made in 2011. I'm going to mention just a few of them for your benefit. You can't quite see it, but on this list, there's Georgia Power. I mention Georgia Power because they do uh, have unions. In fact, my dad was a 33, he was a 32 year man with Georgia Power. Georgia Power sent me to Georgia Tech. Georgia Power, their revenues in 2011 were $17 billion. Now let's equate that per employee. Per employee, that's $83,000 profit per employee. It gets better. It's not a competitiveness issue here. It gets better. That's Coca-Cola. But then there's also UPS. UPS is a union company. Their employees, the guys in the brown suits, the girls in the brown suits who bring your deliveries to your doorstep during Christmas, Thanksgiving, and on all of those special occasions, they themselves, they themselves did exceptionally well. $53 billion record profits in 2011 per employee profits, almost $10,000 per employee. Why am I mentioning this? I'm mentioning this because the senator from the 21st, he said, you know, when we look at this, the reason why is the senator from the 42nd asked him, he said, well, why are we being discriminatory in nature concerning this measure? Lines 99 through 101. When it comes to who we've carved out, we've carved out educators, law enforcement officers. In fact, we carve out martyr because they get federal dollars. Well, the last time I checked, Southern Company, Georgia Power got $8 billion from the federal government. I didn't say $8 million, I said $8 billion. I don't have a problem with that. They employed my father, they sent me to school. I don't have a problem with that at all. First new reactors in the history of this country in the last 30 years, right there in the senator from the 23rd district. I claim it because they took care of me and sent me to school. I voted for Senate Bill 31. I thought it was a good deal. But at the end of the day, we've got employees that were carving out saying it's okay for them to be taken care of and not to have the ability to move forward in the spirit of having redress in the matter of grievances when it comes to these issues. We've said we're going to take you out of this. Let's talk about this a bit further in Section 6. In Section 6, the senator from the 21st, my seatmate, and he did a good job. His first bill, he did a very good job. He talked about family budgets. Well, in Richmond County, second largest city in the state of Georgia, last year in June of 2012, we took these same workers, the bus drivers, the crossing guards, the lunchroom workers, and we told them, that in the summer, instead of you getting the benefits that you've historically gotten, you're no longer going to get those benefits. What did it do? As the senator from the 21st said, family budgets are tight. Budgets were so tight that there were individuals who were on the verge of losing their homes and some who did lose their homes because of the unemployment benefits that they historically counted on, they were no longer available. In fact, it was such a problem in Richmond County that our sheriff, our former sheriff, the distinguished gentleman, Ronnie Strength himself, went on the news and in the media and said, this is wrong, we shouldn't do it, we need to fix this problem. What did we do? We decided we'd still move forward and not fix the problem. I don't know how you feel about it, but I do know this, that when I go home, 
And I represent and stand before those 175,000 citizens in my immediate district, the 200,549,000 citizens in Augusta, Richmond County. They're not going to look at me and say, did you forget about us? They're not going to look at me and say, Senator Davis, we sent you there to represent us. They're not going to look at me and tell me that. They're going to stand up and say, you represented our interest. We understand you're outgunned, but you represented our interest. We still matter to you because we're the ones who sent you there and you didn't forget about us. Now, I don't know about the rest of you today. We can take a party line vote, but what I would encourage you to do is do this. The senator from the 41st has a very good amendment. This bill, while not a perfect bill, is not that bad if you strike Section 6 and beyond. That doesn't fully satisfy the concern, but it makes it a better bill. That's what I would encourage you to do. So that those of us who have not lost our way, those of us who have not forgotten how we got here and who sent us here. Because you're going to go to church Sunday. And then when you go to church, I want you to look at those citizens, those friends, those sisters and those brothers, the boys you go hunting with and the ladies you drink tea with. I want you to think about this. That at the end of the day, all of them aren't going to come to these halls and address you and I. But they believe within themselves that we're going to do what's right because it's right and then do it right to represent their interest. Whether they're an attorney, whether they're a doctor that write campaign checks, or whether they're the lady, the boy, the son, the daughter who stand on the street corners and hold a sign and say, I'm supporting the senator from the 56 because he's my friend. Don't forget about him today. Don't forget about the folks who matter, who sent us here, who at the end of the day, you are their voice. We've been sent here to be the voice to the voiceless. The Bible says the poor shall always be with us. That's true. But at the end of the day, when we pledge allegiance to the Georgia flag, we talk about wisdom, justice, and moderation. Let me tell you what moderation is today. Moderation is striking section six of this measure that's before us. Does nothing to help the bill, just hurts the bill. That's moderation. The wisdom says you don't forget about the people who sent you here. And when in all doubt, allow justice to plead your case. Not because of a scorecard issue, but because you understand that the people who voted for you, when you do what's right because it's right, they'll send you back. The senator from the third third has already said he's been elected 17 times. I don't think he's got a problem with being sent back. Senator from the 18th, he had a tough election, but his folks said, we believe in what you're doing, we send you back. Senators, let's do what's right. We got a measure before us. Senator from the 21st, he's done an admirable job of talking about what it does. I want to encourage you to strike section six. Makes HB 361 a better bill, but still not a perfect bill. At the end of the day, labor matters. It matters because it keeps the lights on. It matters because when they had the hurricane in New Jersey, and along the eastern seaboard, the linemen that they sent up there were your friends and my friends. The guys who are still up there in those areas, cleaning up the streets, cleaning up the cities and the towns, the boroughs, they're your friends and my friends. They're your neighbors. They're my neighbors. Let's not do anything to injure those folks. They do matter. They matter to you and I. Let's make a decision today that tells them that they matter. Mr. President, if there are no questions, I will yield this well. But I believe this is an important matter. No questions. Um, 
Senator from the 41st, Croats, Vermont. Okay, we're going to get to the um, amendments. Chair's going to recognize Senator from the first, I'm sorry, the 20, uh, 29th speak to his amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. I know that we have been here a long time. Um, I would... Uh, I would uh, invite your attention and, and just ask for you to follow with me for a moment or two while I explain amendment number one. Uh, we had a measure similar to this in the Senate last year. It did not contain the language at lines 96 through 101. Thankfully, the senator from the 8th and the senator from the 54th and I were able to put something together uh, to address those <coughs> Uh, those associations that would have been negatively impacted by this legislation and it's certainly a, a better bill uh, this year than it was last year. However, I do think that there's one more step we can take uh, to make this bill better than it currently is. And what you'll see, uh, what I'm really referring to uh, is section four and section five. And what you'll see in section four at lines 94 and 95, and again at section five at lines 115 through 117, is language that essentially says that uh, this, new, uh, this new law will not impair any contract agreement or collective bargaining agreement that's in place. So if a business owner has made the decision to contract with a union in such a way uh, that does not comply with the strictures of Section 4 or Section 5, then they're not going to have to be governed by those. Those contracts won't be voided by this bill. All, the, uh, all Amendment 1 does is extend that pr protection prospectively to continue to allow employers to make the decision about how they are going to handle this practice. There may be employers that don't want uh, every two weeks to be calculating who is in the union and who is out of the union. And I don't think we should be in the business of dictating to those employers uh, how they're going to run their business. And so just as the bill provides protections for bargained for contracts that are already in place, I believe that there should be equal protection going forward and that the freedom to contract uh, by those employers should remain in place. That's really all uh, Amendment 1 does. I do want to uh, try and anticipate what I believe is going to be uh, something you're going to hear in opposition to the amendment, which is, well, the union will, will force uh, an agreement uh, to be put into place if this, is, uh, if this amendment is adopted. And I would simply turn your attention to lines 81 through 84, which explicitly state that no employer or labor, labor organization shall be forced to enter into any agreement, contract, understanding, or practice that subverts the established process by which employees may make informed and free decisions regarding representation and collective bargaining. So all Amendment 1 does is it says to a private business entity that the owner of that entity can have control over their business and decide whether or not they want to allow the practice that is adopted uh, by uh, House Bill 361, or if they would rather have an annual open enrollment process as they have with many other automatic payroll deduction items. And uh, I think it's a very reasonable change. Uh, it's a change that, again, in my opinion, preserves the freedom of the individual business owner to contract, uh, and I would urge uh, your favorable consideration of Amendment 1. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll yield the well. 
Chair and I, Senator from 36. Senator from 30, 41st, he already speak to the amendment. Did you already speak to your amendment? Uh, thank you, Mr. President and colleagues. I rise uh, on House Bill 361 to share uh, a, a few brief thoughts with you, and I, I appreciate the attention that uh, I sense is in the chamber tonight, as several of us have, have come to the well to talk about what we feel is a, a, a really disastrous plight for very low-income families that will be visited on them. Already, $8 million has been denied these families. Can you imagine? the devastation that it means for a family to be working one week, put in the street, and apply for unemployment, and be told you have no income. There's, there's going to be no income for you. There's no unemployment check. We, despite the fact that you've worked 15 years in this system, uh, driving a school bus, working in the, uh, in the lunchroom, Despite that fact, all of a sudden we've got a new labor commissioner, he's turning that off. He's denying you that. No, 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 no warning. Tough it out. Is that who we are? I mean, to me, this is really at heart, it is a moral issue about what's right and wrong and how you treat people. And I have met with people who had this visited upon them. I have heard the stories of people who's lost that little place they had, that roof over their family's head from an eviction because they, they, they no longer had the rent or they, they didn't wait for an eviction. They knew they couldn't pay the rent anymore with, with no income coming in. And they had to move back to mama's or they had to split the children up Put them, in different, put them in different places. People had to live in cars. People had to move out of state to go back because Mama lives in New York. They had, to go, they, had to, they had to look for anything in any way they could. In Savannah, they ran food banks for these employees. It, it, it is, at heart, a moral issue. And when, when you hear that talk about, you know, the GOP doesn't have a heart, or the GOP doesn't care about little people, GOP, uh, you know, just is just stone-faced and cold-hearted when it comes to looking out for the for the for the little guys. I know that's not true of of each of you. I know many of you came from humble circumstances and saw parents or or a single parent do everything they could to give you a start in life. And that you look back on those days and on those, on those parents that rolled up their sleeves and, and, uh, and uh, went to work every day, showed up, played by the rules, and did everything they could to give you a chance to do better than they did. Those are the families we're talking about here. And, and, and we're looking at a time when y'all know what's happened to food prices. You know what, a rent is scandalous these days. Get putting gas in your car, we all know Families with halfway decent incomes are burdened today to meet all their obligations and have anything put back for a rainy day. These folks, by and large, are bumping along on the bottom. And so this, this blow to them is uh, it, it, it's a, it's a full-body blow. It's, 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 it's your down for the count when you don't have... And, that, and that, those unemployment checks, y'all, are not large checks, are they? People here are fairly familiar with the size of those checks. They're minuscule, and they're based on what your earnings were. And we're not talking about somebody that's not eligible for unemployment. We're talking about with a stroke of a pen making them ineligible. Most of you are familiar with the fact that car companies, the, the auto plant, it was standard issue. You, you shut down. You had a model change. The employees of that private corporation got to draw an unemployment check. And you know what? It worked for the family, and it also worked for the company because it kept them, kept that, that stable, trained employee in place and in a position to get right back to work when the model change was finished. 
My kids went to, got to go to college uh, with their daddy's steel mill paycheck. They shut that steel mill down every summer. It was planned. The company planned it. They went in and did, did rehabbing and, uh, you, you know, getting fixed up for the next year. And he drew that unemployment check for that period of time, knowing he was going to go back to that job, a trained uh, steel worker in the rod mill. So this has, been a, this has been a very standard business approach for people who worked in jobs. Textile industry, huge, used to be a huge, Roy Bowen will tell you out there, used to be a huge industry in Georgia. Those textile mills would have downtimes when they would retool. And people would, and they, and they, they would often, they didn't, they would often be, be shut down for two weeks or more in the, in the summer months, in, in July, around the 4th of July. People would be off, draw that unemployment check. Why do you want to treat, why do you want to change the law to treat these people differently than everybody else employed in the private sector in Georgia? It's a mystery to me. Is it really worth wringing those dollars out of their hide and visiting that misery on those families? Is, 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 I mean, is that who we are? It, it's just, it's an ugly proposition, and I, and I feel, I mean, it, it breaks my heart when I met and engaged with people in that workforce who felt they'd been hit by a Mack truck, and they were flat on their back, and what are they going to do? Where are they going to turn? I, I urge and implore you to put this matter straight by simply supporting the Second Amendment of the, of the Senator from the 41st, which would remove Section 6 from this bill. On the issue of, uh, of dues checkoff, again, we're going down a road, and the, the Senator from the 33rd was very eloquent about it. Folks, the truth is that unions are responsible for helping build the middle class in our country. Why? Because they work to get the wages up to where, you know those auto workers in Michigan could send their kids to college? Lord of mercy. Those poor little old textile workers scattered across these Georgia mills all those years didn't make enough to be able to do that in the main. So when you have a decent wage, you have a healthy community, you have a middle class building and growing, and you have a pathway for people to get to the middle class, and that's the backbone of a strong society. That's the backbone when you have opportunity and we have a strong middle class. I urge you to uh, uh, defeat this bill, uh, give people the right to have dignity and a voice on the job through their unions, and, and, and in particular, strike this odious, odious language that would deny these humble members of our workforce, hardworking, with serious responsibilities for our children in our school setting. Uh, let, let's have a heart and do the right thing by deleting that section. Uh, I'm opposed to the bill, and I hope you will join us. And thanks for the close attention that people have been paying tonight. The, the, these are the voices of the little people that we're trying to channel through to you, quite frankly. Thank you. I was going to call on the center from the 28th, but... Uh, 26th, I'm sorry, but uh, were you wishing to be recognized or you, you were, you sure? You were asleep. You was asleep. <laughs> Chair, are you really wanting, you really want, you, all right, for one minute, Chair recognized Senator from 26, yields one minute. You can say more in one minute than most people say in an hour. Mr. President and the members of the Senate, uh, I wish I was asleep. Let me tell y'all something about little folks. I went to uh, school over in Tuskegee, Alabama, because I said I wanted to be somebody. Everybody said if you get an education. I had planned to go to law school, but thought I could be a professional football player. 
1972, I graduated and went up to uh, Washington as a tribe and signed a free agent contract with the Skins. And it was George Allen's first year. And George Allen pulled all kind of shenan shenanigans with football players. First of all, you signed a contract, and when I got, out, got up there, that were 400 other guys trying to make the Washington Redskins. They had to call a free agent trial, and you sign on the dotted line that said that if you got hurt while you were working out, the Washington Redskins weren't responsible for it. We fooled around and worked out that morning. Then they cut it down to about 50 that afternoon. I was in the 50, we were working out. Then all of a sudden they said, well, tell you what, we might call you back. I go on back down to Tuskegee, I get my degree. Come home and my former coach said, well, David, what about coming over here and help us coach uh, football and basketball? I said, well, coach, I hadn't planned on teaching because I didn't think it was enough money in it because my mom and dad had taught school. I go to work, I come up to Atlanta and get me a, what they call a three-year provisional because I only had three hours of education. And what that provisional said is that at the end of the three years, you need to have all of the necessary requirements to be a certified teacher. Well, I did it two years. Uh, the first year I, I coached, and then the head coaching job came over, and they told me I was too young to be the head coach, so I told them to take it and stick it, got on my motorcycle, went up to a place called Sheboygan, Wisconsin, known as Germantown, and played semi-pro ball. They paid us $45 a game, and you got your job. I was working as a rod buster. I took a welding in college just in case I might flunk some, so I'd still be eligible. Didn't know I was going to ever use it. Well, come on back home, teach school. I run for office, get elected, and before the school year started in 74, they tell me that uh, I wasn't going to be hired as a school teacher. Said I wouldn't qualify. And I asked why. Well, you don't have the necessary hours in order to be in the classroom. I said, my provisional says I got three years, and at the end of three years, I'm supposed to do it. Well, they didn't give me a contract. I couldn't draw unemployment because they said I didn't have the hours, so the only thing I could draw was that retirement I put in for the two years. Well, I, I needed a job. I had a family to take care of. Lo and behold, here come the local 1210. Ladies and gentlemen, I had a pick and shovel in my hand. I was down at Paps Blue Ribbon in Perry, Georgia. We were building it. And we were running the big pipes down through the ground. And when they found out that I was a state representative, they stuck me in a hole about 60 feet deep. I said, Lord, if you just let me make it through it. But I had to put food on the table. Now, I worked. I worked so hard. And I worked all the overtime. That I finally made enough money, and I went and bought me a beer and wine light and went and opened up me a club. And the reason I did that is I knew I had to get out of that hole before I hurt somebody. Didn't appreciate being talked to any kind of way. But at least the union gave me an opportunity to make that money. Now here we got a bill that you said doesn't affect local lunchroom school workers. It's an outright lie. This past year they couldn't draw unemployment. They work during the school year, your janitors, your lunchroom workers, your school bus drivers. We provide them an opportunity to get insurance, but yet they couldn't draw unemployment. And now you're talking about a private contract. I'm talking about my folks. I'm talking about those folks who go and work on behalf of the local school system. And guess what? See about your children if, you, if you're in the public school system. Now, many of you might not know nothing about that. Yes, we have a problem with this bill. Because it seems as though it's a one-sided deal, politically. I'm a Democrat, ain't no question about it. 
I'm like Murphy used to say, yellow dog Democrat. But you all have a problem because y'all think giving tax breaks are going to employ folks and make money. You giving tax breaks, and right now you can't tell what is done. Whether or not the folks took the tax breaks and provided the opportunities for job employment as they should have. That's the reason that we're all of a sudden looking at it because our money out the budget is gone. See, nobody talks about that $30 million tax break we gave Delta Airlines, but they bought another airline and split up $350 million between their employees and gave two CEOs $14 million apiece. We don't talk about that. But here we are talking about little folks, the grunts, the people who work all the time just trying to make ends meet and try to make it have a better life for their kids. That's what this bill is about. And the majority of them don't vote Republican. That's what the bill is about. You talking about an employer having, now let me tell you what they did. Brian and Williamson left Macon, Georgia to get out of that tax element. And they formed Reynolds America. Now Brian and Williams is Batters from Britain. The other Reynolds, Reynolds they ain't have no money. They broke. Batters put up the money. So Brian and Williamson employees leave Macon, Georgia, go to North Carolina. Reynolds didn't have a union. You know what they did to them? They had a private vote, but prior to the vote for the union, they brought in retired employees who worked at Reynolds, and when they had to vote, the retired employees were there to outnumber the folks who came from Brian and Weaves, and therefore they didn't get the union. Now that's what these big companies do. Chambers of Commerce could care about care anything about little folks. What happened to us in Macon, Georgia, we had Bill Mill, and they kept the wages down so low, and folks fought it. Didn't want Brian and Williams to come to Macon because of the union. Not only that, we had an opportunity to get Miller. They went to Albany. But after we got Brian and Williams, we didn't want no more unions. Because they provided a wage for folks to stand up and talk to folks. Didn't have to take a whole lot of buying down all the time. This bill is bad for Georgia. You can look around and you can talk to folks, but when you walk out in the halls and when you walk down the street, and guess what? When you're out there on that road and you have a flat tire, won't be the alligator shoes wearing, silk stocking, brief case talking folks with cigars in the mouth to stop and help you is going to be that little guy. So I said to you, let's think about what we're doing here today. Let's think about moderation. Let's think about little folks who have built this great state that we have. Mr. President, I yield away. I was wrong about that minute. Chair, and I, Senator of the 49th, what purpose you rise? Parliamentary inquiry. Oh, I thought you had something better than that, but uh, state your inquiry. If that was a minute, I'd like to hire the senator for an hour's worth of work. <laughs> <laughs> well, we still have levity. Really? <laughs> Chair, and I, Senator of the 19th. Thank you, Mr. President. I take a little offense as a person who hires a number of people. I probably got all together about 100 people hired at the fact that we don't care about, as Republicans don't care about the working folks. I don't know how many of you have ever written an unemployment check, but I've written a lot of them, a lot of them, as well as workers' comp. And you know, that unemployment check I write, I, none of that is deducted out of any worker's pay. 
That comes out of my pocket. This, this past year, we have passed an immigration bill, and frankly, I disagreed with a lot of the bill and fought for some changes in the bill. This year, because I could not get workers, and I applied at the Department of Labor for 54 workers to rake pine straw. You know how many I got? One. Now, I don't know the reasons for that, except for the fact that when you get 99 weeks of unemployment, nobody wants to rake pine straw when you can draw 99 weeks of unemployment. And we, as a General Assembly, extended that. So I advertised and finally had to get some H-2B workers or either shut my business down. That's complicated getting H-2B workers. These are legal workers with visas. But all the time I did that, I had to apply at the Department of Labor that these jobs were available for Americans, and I had to hire them first. Finally, I got one African-American kid who came to work and actually has come to work every day. Now, he can't make production, but we're working with him because I want him to be successful. And his parents, they bring him every day, and they thank me that I've given him a job. And I, I'm hoping he's going to be successful. But folks, as somebody who pays into the trust fund on a monthly basis so that people can have unemployment when they do lose their job, I'm offended when you say, I don't care about workers. I took the risk, borrowed the money, when nobody thought it would work, that you could actually sell pine straw. And I've developed that into two or three other companies, including a restaurant, some other companies. If it weren't for people like us, us I'm not getting rich at this game. I'm suffering just like every other small business. The thing I can't figure out is what I'm doing up here when I need to be home trying to create some more jobs and make a business work. But just remember, there are employers out there too that have to pay workers' comp and insurance, all the mandates that we pass in insurance up here. Workers' comp, unemployment, general liability insurance. Last year I paid $150,000 in insurance premiums not including workers' comp and unemployment insurance. Some of us are taking the risk to make all this happen. I'd like folks in this chamber just to remember that when you pass these kind of bills. You wish to close the debate, or you think enough's been said, Senator? <laughs> We're well, going to have that right. Questions on Amendment Number One, authored by the Senator from the Twenty Nine. Is there objection? There is objection. You wish to Asian nays? All of those in favor of Amendment Number One, authored by the Senator from the Twenty Nine, will vote aye. Those opposed, no. Secretary will unlock the machine. Chair, recognize Senator from the 21st. Mr. President, I'd just like to remind everybody to vote no on this, please. Senator, the author has uh, requested no vote. Senator from the 29th has requested a yay vote.
On the pass of the bill, the yeas are, or the amendment, the yeas are 22 and the nays are 27, and the amendment has lost. Now the question is on amendment number two. Is there objection? There is objection. All those in favor of amendment number two will vote aye. Those opposed, no. Secretary will unlock the machine. Chair, can I Senator on the 40th? What purpose you rise? Mr. President, parliamentary inquiry. State your inquiry. Isn't it true the NFIB, the Georgia Chamber, the Georgia Traditional Manufacturers Association, and the Georgia Child Care Association are against this amendment? <clears throat> Chair, recognize Senator on the 41st. What purpose you rise? Parliamentary inquiry, Mr. State Chairman. your inquiry. Is it not true that Senate Amendment 2 will make this bill pass the scope of law as a one subject matter and protect thousands of workers from being unfairly treated different than other workers in Georgia. Each senator has great passion on the issue. On the adoption of the amendment, the yeas are 16, the nays are 35, and the amendment has been lost. The question now is on the adoption of committee substitute. Is there objection? Without objection, committee substitute is adopted. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the bill? Is there objection? Agree in the Porter Committee, which fail pass the bill. Chairs, none. Porter Committee is agreed to. Shall the main question be now put? All those in favor vote aye. Those opposed, no. Secretary, unlock the machine. On the pass of the bill, the yeas are 36 and the nays are 16. This bill, MC Rex Constitution Majority, is therefore adopted. Secretary will read House Bill 150. House Bill 150 by Representatives Bruce of the 61st and others. A bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 1 of Title 10, Chapter 1 of Title 35, Article 4 of Chapter 18 of Title 50, and Title 51 of the OCGA relating to selling and other trade practices, general provisions for law enforcement officers and agencies, inspection of public records and torts, and for other purposes. The Committee of the Senate on Special Judiciary recommends that this bill do pass. Amendment 1. Senator Stone of the 23rd and others offer the following amendment. Amend House Bill 150 by replacing lines 54 through 57 with the following. Radio station or network or television station or network and the publication or dissemination in print or electronically of news or commentary or an advertisement and for other purposes. Amendment 2. Senator Schaefer of the 48th offers the following amendment. Amend House Bill 150 by inserting publicly available after persons on line 39. Through with the order, Mr. President. Chair recognize Senator from the 23rd to present the bill. Thank you, Mr. President. Senators, the hour is late, so I will be brief. Uh, HB 150 amends the uh, Fair Business Practices Act to uh, snuff out a scam that's going around Georgia. 
and that is uh, sites, websites that are posting uh, mug shots uh, or keeping the mug shots up there long after people are exonerated or their records are expunged or whatever. Uh, but they're, they've got a scam going because they, they'll charge you to remove the, the mug shot. I didn't realize how big a scam this is, um, but there are dozens of these websites, and usually the people that run the websites run the uh, businesses that, that charge people to remove the pictures. One uh, removal site is called removalslander.com. And they, this is something that's gotta be stopped, and all this bill does is uh, preclude the charging to have your mugshot removed if you're dis exonerated or expunged. And uh, it's the fair thing to do, the right thing to do. And I, I would urge your uh, voting in favor of this. Now the two amendments, one offered by me and one offered uh, by uh, the senator um, from the 48th, is, uh, are both good amendments. Uh, they tighten it up, make sure we're not infringing on any First Amendment rights, and so I would urge uh, you to vote in favor of both Amendments 1 and 2. If there are no further questions, Mr. President, I'll yield the well. Chair recognizes uh, Senator from the 48th speak to his amendment. Senator from the 23rd has already spoke to his. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen of the Senate, I believe the author adequately uh, explained the effect of the amendment. The, uh, the bill obviously is, an, is aimed at websites that are publishing mug shots and then charging people uh, to have those mug shots removed. The, um, um, the amendment carves out uh, companies that are um, with, with websites that aren't publicly available, that aren't doing that, but that may be providing mug shots for law enforcement or some other purpose. The uh, amendment's agreeable to the author, and I would encourage your favorable consideration. If there are no questions, I yield the way. Questions on adoption of floor amendment number one. Is there objection? Without objection, amendment number one is adopted. Question now is on amendment number two. Is there objection? Without objection, amendment number two is adopted. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the bill? Is the objection agreed in the Portal Committee which fail to pass the bill? Chairs, none. All those in favor, vote aye. Those opposed, no. Secretary, unlock the machine. On the pass the bill, the yeas are 53, the nays are zero. This bill, I'm Rex Constitution Majority, is therefore passed. Secretary will read House Bill 187. House Bill 187 by Representative Dickerson of the 113th and others. A bill to be entitled an act to amend code section 16-32.6 of the OCGA relating to manufacturing, distributing, dispensing, or possessing with intent to distribute controlled substance or marijuana and for other purposes. The Committee of the Senate on Judiciary and on Civil recommends that this bill do pass. Through the order, Mr. President. On the chair of the Senator from 17.
Thank you, Mr. President, members of the Senate. Several cities and counties have adopted drug-free commercial zones and ordinances, and these ordinances are not valid unless we ratify them with general law. Right now, there's four cities, Eatonton, Atlanta, Social Circle, and College Park, and this bill will add the city of Portadale. And Mr. President, if there's no questions, I'll yield the whale. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the bill? Is there objection agreeing the Portal Committee which failed to pass the bill? All those in favor vote aye. Those opposed, no. Secretary, unlock the machine. On the pass of the bill, the yeas are 53, the nays are 0. This bill, I'm serious, the Constitution majority is therefore passed. Secretary Reed, House Bill 354. House Bill 354 by Representative Clark of the 101st and others. A bill to be entitled an act to amend Title 20 of the OCGA relating to education so as to revise terminology relating to early care and learning and for other purposes. The Committee of the Senate on Education and Youth recommends that this bill do pass. Amendment 1. Senator Williams of the 19th and others offer the following amendment. Amend House Bill 354 by adding after the semicolon on line 100 the following. Provided, however, that no department official or employee of the executive branch may commit to participation in a federal education program unless the department official or employee first informs the General Assembly and for other purposes. Through with the order, Mr. President. <laughs> Chair recognizes the Senator from the 23rd again. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senators, uh, this bill uh, closes a loophole uh, in the uh, rules governing um, child care learning center, excuse me, family daycare homes. Um, it does a few other things, but the, the loophole closed deals with the number of children that are authorized to be kept. Um, and that is in uh, re private residences uh, the limit is six children under the age of 13. Now, that's a, those are both, uh, the age limit is a change from 18. But what we've done in this bill is made it clear that those six children uh, are the maximum limit unless it's a family member. And that is regardless of whether uh, these other children that are in the home uh, neighbors, friends, children, whatever, are kept there for pay or not for pay. Um, the uh, Department of Early Care and Learning has determined that there's a lot of circumvention of the six-person limit by claiming that the uh, extra persons are not there uh, being paid for. Now, you will see that there have been a lot of tragedies in these homes uh, that sometimes result from too many kids uh, in violation of the rules. Well, this will make it clear that that six-person limit uh, holds regardless of whether they're there for pay or not for pay. It does two other things. It allows the, um, uh, the head of the Department of Early Care and Learning to recommend to owners of these facilities uh, that they carry liability insurance. Um, if they do not follow that recommendation, they have, to, uh, they have to disclose that prominently in the business and in writing to the uh, parents who entrust their children to these uh, facilities. Now, there's an amendment 
uh, that has been offered to a part of the bill that uh, authorizes the governor to uh, designate to the head of the agency the right to administer federal programs that, uh, uh, that pertain to this area of education. Um, this is a, an amendment that has not been vetted. Um, it is not something that we have a position on from the governor's office of uh, the Department of Early Care and Learning. I would not advise voting for Amendment 1. But please vote for uh, the bill by itself. If there are no further questions, I yield the will. Chair, I recognize Senator 54 to speak to the bill. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the Senate. Appreciate the uh, hard work of the chairman, the senator from the 23rd on this bill. I will leave each senator to his or her discretion on whether they support the underlying bill. The senator from the 23rd said that the administration had not had an opportunity to vet or weigh in on the amendment that is before you. Let me do that now. This is an attack on the executive power of the government of, the, of this uh, state. It is overbroad. It would require that if we said we want to participate in a, uh, a, a, an informative program, take home a postcard and, uh, and, and mail it off to somebody, program, any program at DECAL, that the executive would not be allowed to do that unless it came here and gave a full report. Uh, I oppose this amendment. I ask that you oppose this amendment. We believe in co-equal branches in Georgia. And I would ask that you would reject the amendment. Mr. President, I would yield for questions. If there are none, I'd yield the will. You have questions. Chair, can I send them to the night? Will the Senator yield? I yield. Uh, on line two, it says that the, any employee of the executive branch can't even commit to participate in a federal program. Is that not what it says? That's what I read. So, so the governor of the state of Georgia couldn't go speak on a panel because he would be participating in a federal program. He, he would need to come ask our permission, it looks like. No further questions. Thank or, you, Mr. Uh, President. No, I'm sorry. You do have a question. Chair, recognize Senator for 50 sec 40 seconds for a question. Well, Senator, you? I certainly do. It, do you read this like I do, that it, it doesn't even limit it to decal? I mean, it, it says any federal education program at all. Is that true? Is it that broad? That's, it, it looks that broad to me, Senator, uh, and that's another reason to oppose the amendment. Chair, recognize Senator from 33rd. Mr. Leader, do you yield? I yield. You reckon we could get him to participate in some of these federal programs? <laughs> <laughs> Let me apologize. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the will. What is that on? What is that on? Is that on this bill? Chair, can I assume the 19th for speak to his amendment? Has it been read? Thank you, Mr. President. I've already made one speech this session on the separation of powers. I don't think I'll make another one. But I do want to say that, you know, we do have powers in the, in the legislature. And while I respect the powers of the governor, and this, this may be a little broad, but I think we capitulate our powers often as well in the General Assembly. And we ought to we ought to be saying that if the governor is going to spend state money and do something like we've done with rates to the top and Common Core, which you all are starting to wake up on now and st starting to figure out you really don't like Common Core as much as you thought he, you did, but if you'd been in, on the front end of that decision, which this amendment would have put you on the front end of that decision, Maybe we wouldn't be spending $30 million this year to try to figure out how to test kids rather than 
a much smaller amount, money that we could have been spending on something else. What the amendment does is just say, Governor, if you're going to participate in a federal pro program where you're going to spend state monies, we, a we ask you to let us know about it. I don't think that's an overreach. Now, I realize I don't have the votes to pass this amendment because the governor's weighed in and the author's weighed in. But at some point in time, we got to stop giving away the powers of the Senate and start watching what is happening. Mr. President, no questions, I yield well. Mr. President. One question, Chair, recognize Senator on the 46 for a question. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, Senator Yield. I do. Just, just to make sure I understand this, this doesn't require the executive branch to get permission from the legislative branch, just that they inform us before they take such actions that make those type of commitments for the state? That's correct. Thank you, Senator. No further questions, Senator. The question is on amendment number one, authored by the Senator from the 19th. Is there objection? There is objection. All those in favor of amendment number one will rise, stand, and be counted. If you're in favor of amendment number one, rise, stand, and be counted. Reverse. The senator from the 33rd, quit posing for the governor. He's already going home. That might have been the best one all day. <laughs> On the amendment, the yeas are 18 and the nays are 34, and the amendment is lost. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the bill? Is there objection? Agree the Porter Committee, which fail pass the bill. Chairs, none. Porter Committee is agreed to. Shall the main question be now put? Are there any objections? All those in favor, vote aye. Those opposed, no. Secretary, lock the machine. On the pass of the bill, the yeas are 45 and the nays are 8. And this bill, MC Rex Constitution, majority is therefore adopted. <laughs> Secretary will read the last bill of the day, House Bill 454. House Bill 454 by Representative Martin of the 49th and others. A bill to be entitled an act to amend code section 45-12-75 of the OCGA relating to the contents and form of the budget report so as to require certain items to be included in the tax expenditure review and for other purposes. The Committee of the Senate on Appropriations recommends that this bill do pass. Through with the order, Mr. President. Chair, recognize Senator the 19th. Thank you, Mr. President. Last bill of the evening. Um, the Department of Audits and Accounts provides the Office of Planning and Budget every year with a, and their budget report a tax expenditure review. Uh, what this this is a permissive language that asks them to uh, provide. Uh, to the Office of Planning and Budget, an analysis of the tax expenditures that we have, is like the tax credits we give for this or that, to be a part of that report so we know 
if, if the laws we're passing regarding tax expenditures are meeting their mark. Now, no question, Mr. President, I yield the well. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the bill? Is there objection? Agreed to the committee, which failed to pass the bill. Chairs, none. Porter committee is agreed to. Shall the main question be now put? Are there any objections? Chairs, none. Main question order. Shall this bill now pass? Question on pass the bill. All those in favor of the bill, vote aye. Those opposed? Secretary, unlock the machine. Senator from the 53rd, on the pass of the bill, the yeas are 51, the nays are zero. This bill, MC Rex Constitution Majority, is therefore passed. One little special order to take care of before we close. Chair and I serve on the 53rd. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate adhere to its disagreement to the House Amendment to the Senate substitute to House Bill 142 and that a conference committee be appointed. Is there object? Read the caption. House Bill 142 by Representative Rossman of the 7th and others. A bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 5 of Title 21 of the OCGA relating to ethics and government so as to change certain provisions relating to powers and duties and further purposes. Is there objection? Without objection, Chair appoints the Senator from the 53rd, the Senator from the 48th, and the Senator from the 16th. Conferees to 142. Chair recognizes the Majority Leader.
Thank you, Mr. President. I move the Senate stand adjourned until 10 a.m. March 26th. I'm here 14 hours away. 14 hours away. Are there any announcements to be made? Rules Anything else? Uh, rules will meet upon adjournment. Is that right? 450. All those excited ones that are ready to adjourn and are in favor will say aye. All those opposed, no. no. And the eyes clearly have it. We stand adjourned.